Hello, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for October 20th, 2015. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Today, we're joined by Jim Clausing online. Welcome, Jim, and I hear you have some really big fans in your <laughs> in your vicinity. In your vicinity. Yeah, it's a little noisy in my office today. Okay, well, uh, keep those fans in, under control, and uh, we'll, we'll continue on here. Welcome. We have Matt Kaiser on the program today. How's it going? Jim, which would you say is your biggest fan? <laughs> <laughs> you guys. Oh. <laughs> Very good. And uh, John Hogobin, welcome. Yep. Thanks. For, uh, good to be here. I'm Brian Rexrode. And you know what we would like to do to start out today is, uh, as we did last week, just a reminder, this is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Of course, the folks that are watching this program are obviously aware of cybersecurity, but we want to try to proliferate that to some others. And so one of the things we wanted to highlight today is that, uh, well, first of all, again, we had mentioned last week the AT&T Cybersecurity Conference. The videos for the program have been posted. We'll provide the URL for you here. Welcome to the 17th annual AT&T Cybersecurity Conference. The cybersecurity landscape is changing not only on an annual basis, as I can see the discussions changing just year over year. So the architecture itself is not just security to go with the cloud, it's security that's in the cloud for the cloud. We're able to prevent, detect, and respond in near real time. Uh, I've been trying to just absorb everything looking at it from so many different angles and thinking outside the box, that's what really stuck with me. No one is immune to these attacks, and so we need to think about how do we protect ourselves. We're protecting our data, we're protecting our applications, and that's how we have to think about it from a digital security perspective. But the real problem is that most software just sort of kind of barely works. That's the sneaky secret of software. Finding out what my colleagues are doing, what at and is finding out, to see how I can change my metrics to get more funding and get the board to support all the programs I'm trying to get done. Everybody can share stories and share experiences to help do a better job of keeping the bad guys out. of us need to take more pride in what we do. And I think the first thing that we need to do as a group is acknowledge that we're not impressed anymore when somebody breaks into something. Breaking into something, find one problem. Doing what we do, solve all problems. Which one are you gonna dig into? One of the things that we wanted to feature or sort of point out for you is that there was a presentation at the conference on AT&T's Cybersecurity Awareness Program. And a big part of this is uh, trying to get awareness out to the people so that uh, everybody can be a part of the security solution. Uh, so that presentation is available. And there are also four sample videos featuring Murray. Murray's here with us today. He's not as happy as he always is on the videos, or at least many times on the videos. But in any case, Murray is a, a featured part of those, uh, those videos and a part of our security awareness program. So again, uh, something to help with uh, awareness that uh, perhaps you can use with the employees of your organization, or even perhaps with your family. And so even continuing on that, we'd like to feature a, uh, basically a website with additional resources. Again, this is focused on awareness or uh, cyber awareness for people, helpful information for humans is what I called it here, but it's the uh, cyberaware.securethehuman.org website, and I think this is uh, facilitated by uh, SANS partly. I found it had a lot of uh, topic areas that are often uh, perhaps neglected in other areas. For example, uh, security awareness posters are available there for you know, perhaps posting around your business. Human risk survey, you know, what is the, uh, to get some idea of what the, uh, what the risks are, right? And uh, securing your security for your kids. How would you talk with your kids about security and even uh, providing uh, 
you know, t talking tips for talking with teenagers about security online. And then uh, another example, you know, how to stay secure when you're traveling. So lots of areas where we need to be thinking about security a little bit more, good opportunities for improving cybersecurity awareness. It's a really good resource. And if you've ever heard Lance Spitzner, who is behind the Securing the Human uh, program there, give his Securing the Kids talk, it's really a good one on, on how to make your kids aware of the need you know, to be safe when they're online. Mm -hmm. Yep, very good. So we have Murray to help with uh, cybersecurity awareness. Go back, take a look at the, uh, the at t Security Conference materials and also some other uh, materials online for perhaps if you're outside of an enterprise environment or perhaps even in a small business. So Matt, let's go to you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about rooting mobile devices, good or bad. What are the little twists and turns in this one? Well, this is an interesting <laughs> story. Um, so there was a paper put out by some researchers at University of California, Riverside. Mm -hmm. The paper's called Android Root and its Providers, a Double-Edged Sword. And the, the, the general gist of this paper is they took a look at the Android Root Provider applications. Now, if people aren't familiar with Android rooting, it's the same as iOS jailbreaking. It's mm -hmm. getting root access on your device in order to make changes that typically the operating system wouldn't allow you to have. Mm -hmm. uh, this can be both a good thing and a bad thing. If you're a power user and you'd like to get the latest patches, maybe you want to install some software you've written yourself, there's, other good, there's, there's reasons that people would want to root their phone. Mm -hmm. However, it also bypasses a lot of the security that's built into the phone to prevent malware from actually taking those same kinds of super high-level actions you know, subverting the security systems. Mm -hmm. um, so a root provider is a tool that you would find maybe on the Android marketplace or elsewhere that you would install on your phone. It would tell you, okay, you're, you're running you know, this phone model. We happen to have a root exploit. Click the button to root your phone. Mm -hmm. And that could be, like we said, very useful. However, you've got tools that have hundreds of these different you know, specific root exploits, or maybe they chain two exploits together to go from user level to root level. Um, the question is, are these, are these things you want to be putting out into the public? Because if someone can reverse engineer an Android application and pull that root code out, they can slap that back into malware and use the same thing without asking the user's permission to gain root on the device and make those same kind of high-level changes. So it's kind of like they say, a double-edged sword. Right. You know, there are great reasons you'd want to be able to use this, but are you really, you know, should there be some sort of basic um, requirements for, if you're going to put this out there, you've got to protect it doing A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I find it a pretty interesting paper to read. Um, they talk about some, there's some very well-known root providers out there that will do things like you know, package the root exploits in ways you can't find them, that not only can someone who looks at the code not find it, antivirus can't find it. Mm -hmm. And there's, again, there's two sides to that, where you know, if antivirus can't find the root exploit, that means that you're able, to, you're able to run this at the same time you're running your antivirus and it's not gonna cause a problem. But it also means that if someone steals that code and it's packed like that, AV's not gonna find it either. So right, there's right. a lot to say about this. I found it was a really good read. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it, it, it kind of gets into that area where, you know, and I, I kind of reflect back on there have been, I, I remember about three or four attempts to create legislation to suggest that development of malware should be illegal. Mm. And this, is, this whole notion is that it's, it's really a, a difficult one to decide whether something is really malware or if it's something, if you're, it's just a demonstration or if it has a, a legitimate purpose. And this is really kind of, uh, I think, a pretty good example of is it good, is it bad? Well, mm -hmm. it has some good attributes. It has some perhaps bad attributes. And uh, so it's, it really becomes, it's a good example of what the challenge might be and how you even define what malware is. Yeah. And the fact that they're endorsing it, I mean, having providing it on the market uh, kind of suggests that you know, they're trying to keep an open mind about what is considered malicious versus, versus good. Yeah. You know, another interesting aspect that you say that the bad guys could take those exploits and do something about, you know, use them in a malicious way. By the same token, Google could go, go ahead and take those exploits and actually like patch. patch. That's true. <laughs> yeah. well, but the whole patching, the patching ecosystem, as we know, is yeah. very fragmented. The same way that the operating system updates are fragmented, yeah. the patching goes the same way. Yeah, it so, depends on the, uh, the device provider right. to actually exactly. incorporate those patches as a part of it. But yeah. at least there's the opportunity to get something done there. So the bad guys as well as the good. It, looking at it from the other direction, generally speaking, security by obscurity is not a very good practice. Now, 
actually putting it right out there in someone's face is, is one thing, but they still have to be able to reverse engineer this and actually use it. Um, you know, I think we were talking a little bit earlier that, you know, ultimately, I think this might even come up in a different context, that is, you know, when you lock your doors and your windows, it's really just keeping the good guys out. It's not necessarily keeping the bad guys out. If they have a will, they're just gonna, they're gonna find a way, mm -hmm. so. Interesting. You said something earlier about determining whether something is malware or not. Now, I can't claim to solve that problem right here, but I think the key is informed consent. Yeah. So if a user has the opportunity to look at, take a look and say, I understand what's going to happen if I press this button, it's going to root my phone, it's going to mm -hmm. have these security implications, and you click yes, that's probably not malware. Now, if the user doesn't understand, or this goes on behind the scenes, you install the app and it automatically roots your phone, that's probably a little bit closer to malware, in my, my opinion. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, a tricky could... one as well, because oh, sure. there are an awful lot of completely legitimate apps that are free, mm -hmm. that aren't so free, that I think most people aren't even quite aware of what the ecosystem is that actually funds and What those. that trade-off is that <laughs> yeah, you're actually what the, making. Yeah. What that trade-off is. But. And I was going to say, if the terms of use is, you know, a 100-page oh, thing yeah. that you have to flip through, and it's on page 87 that says, we're going to use your phone to do Bitcoin mining, no one's ever going to read that, even though they say, okay, agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So not that, they, I mean, there might have been isolated cases of people doing that, but, you know, yeah. like you said, disclosure, as long as it's obviously apparent to you, yeah. but sometimes somebody could bury that in something that you're never going to read. Cause it's How big. is it that flashlight I, app wears the battery down on my phone when I never use the flashlight app? Right, right. right. Awesome. <laughs> to go back to that, the, the patching thing, uh, there was an interesting article that I just saw um, out of Carnegie Mellon, just saw it yesterday or the day before about, you know, how the ecosystem and how long it takes for updates to show up. And basically, OS updates often don't happen. You have to wait to get a new phone until you get serious OS updates, at least in the Android space. Yep. Well, thanks, Matt, for that story on the on the root apps. You know, I think one of the things that we probably want to sort of emphasize here is that if you don't know what you're doing, it probably isn't a good idea to use those root apps. Yeah, you should definitely that is understand. professional driver only. So with that, let's go to Jim here. And uh, Jim, Diffie-Hellman cracking, I guess there's been some uh, discussion about it. What can you tell us? Yeah, Brian, um, just like Matt's story was... Uh, about a paper that was delivered last week at the ACM CCS conference. Uh, this week, uh, there was a paper delivered there by a group that had actually talked about their results back in May, back when Logjam came out, about weaknesses in Diffie-Hellman. And especially this week, some of the talk was, you know, is this how NSA has been breaking, you know, VPN and uh, HTTPS and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a really interesting paper. I actually highly recommend that uh, folks go check the paper out. Um, but uh, Steve Bellavin had a really good take on it that, that mirrors my take on it is we've known for a long time that 1,024-bit Diffie-Hellman uh, was going to be uh, problematic. In in 2004, they were already saying that that was probably going to be crackable in in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. And so these guys in this paper have shown that 1024-bit uh, Diffie-Hellman is is crackable, and you really should be moving to you know longer key lengths, at least, you know, the 2048-bit group or or something stronger than that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's a really good paper that's been getting a lot of attention just because of, you know, s people throwing out Snowden's name and the NSA mm -hmm. cracking stuff. But, you know, the point is what we've always known about, about crypto is, you know, the, you're, you're only buying yourself time, and longer key lengths buy you more time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, they're actually, one of the things that I did want to point out is um, these guys put together a, a website that they called weekdh.org that gives a lot of good tips 
for mm -hmm. how to um, turn on the stronger, you know, the 2048-bit groups for the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, you know, how to modify your Apache web server, your Nginx, your uh, IIS, you know, your postfix and send mail, uh, your open SSH, how to strengthen the, um, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange on all of those. So uh, there are ways that you can, you know, strengthen the security of the systems where you're trying to run securely. Um, so I, I do highly recommend that weakdh.org, uh, the, the tips that they've got for tightening things up there. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. You know, I guess a couple of my, my thoughts on this. First of all, there tends to be, you know, NSA might be doing the cracking here. I guess if you're trying to find a high bar to say, you know, if they can't crack it, then nobody can kind of thing, that's probably a good reference point. But personally, I wouldn't be considering them to be the enemy that you're really trying to protect against. I mean, fundamentally speaking, if you're concerned about somebody cracking your encryption, they're probably not the ones that are going to be exploiting it in a, in a negative way. That, that's at least their, right. their mission anyway. But uh, I guess that put into perspective, you know, the, the, the graphics processor units have been lowering costs and they have an enormous amount of computation power and there have been a lot of demonstrations about how you can purchase those for relatively cheap, especially if you get the previous version, you know, PS3s, for example, and then fill your shelves with a bunch of those off of, uh, perhaps off of eBay, and you can get an awful lot of computation power uh, out of those. And so the opportunity to crack these types of things. I tend to think about, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about locking your doors and your windows. And I think about in some parts of the city where you see that they, they don't just have the lock on the door, they have the bolt, they have the bar, the you know. Right. Down over the so you have to decide what is most important to you. Is the additional computation power required for, you know, using a, a higher level of encryption, which really isn't a big deal these days. You know, raising your key length, rank, length is not that big a deal. Why not do it? Um, but I guess it's also important to keep in mind, and I think you pointed this, this out, Jim, it's not just the web access, it's email, it's you know, SSH. There are other applications that are often overlooked in terms of needing decent encryption on it, perhaps even needing better encryption than some other things that uh, perhaps need paying attention to. Right, and one, one of the things that the paper pointed out is you know, that with the, with the computing resources available today, it's Get the the 1024 bit group is now within reach of you know nation state type actors, mm -hmm. which means you know give it a couple of years and it will be within you know reach of uh, you know criminal organizations with just with the funds that they've got available. So mm -hmm. right, it doesn't take a a ten billion dollar you know black budget to, to be able to, to break these things. And within a few years, you know, it will probably be commodity hardware will be able to break it. Yep. All right. Well, certainly something to keep in mind in, uh, in terms of renewing our efforts to make sure that the, uh, the, as keys get replaced, especially they get replaced with, uh, with stronger keys. So John, let's go to you. And, um, there's a certain, this is, I guess, a, another one of these so things. Yeah, is it malware? Is it not malware? <laughs> Matt was talking about earlier. Is it malware? Is it not? This is a, kind of an updated look at the FinFisher software. Um, it's surveillance software. Um, it's kind of that middleware of being, is it malware? Is it not? Mm -hmm. um, and this is a, um, this was kind of, they were outed around the 2012 timeframe as this company that manufactures the software. Uh, provides it to a lot of various law enforcement or nation states uh, for the purposes, whatever they want to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of describe the architecture a little bit of how this software works. Um, it has these fin spy proxies, they call them, which is what usually the victim machine is going to talk to a proxy. The proxy relays back to a master or maybe through a couple of proxies until it hits a master. And then the master is probably hosted by whoever owns that software, mm -hmm. right? So they discovered, uh, and also they've been criticized for selling this to various uh, 
repressive nations, you right. know, that don't have very good human rights. Um, they might be spying on their citizens. And, and that in itself is a tricky one because even if it's a rogue nation or if they, you know, they tend to oppress human rights, they still have law enforcement requirements that they have to uphold. Right. So, you know, how they're using it really comes down to whether it's, you know, really legitimate right. or not. Yeah. And in their part of the world, that might be perfectly normal business as usual, whereas different in, cultures, different. in a democracy, yeah. perhaps not. In any event, so Citizen Lab uh, did a little research. Uh, also, the source code was uh, released back in 2014. They got hacked into, mm -hmm. I guess it was the mm -hmm. same, yeah, perhaps the same that, team yeah. that did the, the hacking team um, uh, breach as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they've conclusively proven that, it but in any event. the same Twitter account. That oh, okay. both, so, but yeah, there's a lot of close association there. In any event, so Citizen Lab has done um, a little analysis, and they were able to determine that if um, you run ZMap, they use ZMap, they scan the internet several times over the past year here, and in the course of doing that, when they would hit these proxies, the proxy actually makes a connection back to the master, the fin master, and there's a lot of decoy pages. So typically, if you hit one of these things and you're not talking to it, the way the malware wants you to talk to it, they just present a decoy page. And that mm. decoy page is usually like Google or Yahoo or something. So they just kind of proxy you over to one of those sites. So uh, what they're able to determine is if you hit the Google, you know, hit it as though you're not the malware and you get relayed through to the master, you get a Google page presented to you. So you can do things like, what's my IP address? And you will see mm. the IP address of the master server uh, because Google's returning that result mm. to you. So interesting little, uh, and the, with Yahoo, they, Yahoo didn't have the same type of functionality that Google has, but um, you can like go to weather.yahoo.com and find out, well, where is this server located? Because it, it shows you the weather located for the geolocation of that IP address. Mm. Uh, so they're able to determine some things to the mat. So one of the things, basically, they did a pretty nice report here. Actually, the report is very long, so it's probably worth it. It's, it's an interesting read. Um, and they were able to map all of the locations of the Fin Master servers using this technique mm -hmm. uh, and what countries these Fin Master servers are located in. They have a list of all of them there. Uh, in some cases, they were able to actually isolate that IP address by registrar to certain law enforcement organizations in those countries or other governmental address blocks owned by those governments in those mm -hmm. uh, uh, in those countries. So interesting read. Um, this has kind of been well known. Most uh, antivirus picks this up. I will say this software platform uh, is pretty ubiquitous in that it's you know available for Windows. I'm not sure about Mac, but it's definitely on a lot of mobile platforms. So mm -hmm. Android, iOS, um, even like Symbian, a lot uh, of these other oddball yeah. ones. So it's you know it's available out there and they use a lot of interesting techniques for uh deployment so that they'll trick you into like this a fake flash adobe flash update but mm. in reality it's their malware that's getting deployed um or some other you know um exploit vector like that or even just standard you know uh, phishing emails and whatnot mm -hmm. to trick you into installing it which would be a typical type of thing so uh interesting read um and again this is kind of being used it's commercial surveillance software, kind of commercialized malware in a way, used by these various um, organizations for their own law enforcement type activities, so. All right, well, it's an interesting one. You know, it, it, I mean, particularly the sort of cleverness of being able to kind of map it out and get some right. idea where That's kind of what I thought was an interesting, yeah. interesting aspect is that they discovered kind of a little bit of a data leakage issue that the, whoever yeah. developed the software didn't really probably anticipate, and they were able yeah. to use that in order to map these out. Yeah. And just an example where security by obscurity just doesn't really pay off in the end, right? Right, right. <laughs> I think it's interesting that even though Finn Fisher has, you know, they've had their entire contents dumped out to the world to see, they're still getting customers. Oh yeah, it's, it's just still an operation, yeah. 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 I don't know. All right, next topic here. Top five holes in your enterprise security strategy. You know, actually, we'll call it five or six holes in your enterprise security strategy. This came from an article on CBR online, and it was, um, you know, actually, they didn't call it the top five holes, but they certainly referred to five holes in your enterprise security strategy. You know, if Melanie Anson, when her, were here, you know, last week we talked a little bit about her presentation about creating a more positive face for information security. I'm not sure she'd be really happy with this notion of, you know, kind of 
talking about holes in enterprise right. security, we should be talking more Let's about solutions, more positive spots. approach. But <laughs> nevertheless, we're going to talk about this a little bit here. First of all, on the list, uh, insufficient DDoS protection. You know, my impression is that most organizations that need to be paying attention to DDoS protection probably are a little bit at this point. Right. They might not have a sufficient solution, but I think um, you know they, they're at least aware of the of the threat, and if they're under attack, they're you're going to do something about that. So I'm not sure I agree with it entirely, but you know, it's certainly something that uh, folks should be paying attention to. If you don't have a plan for DDoS protection, particularly one that you know, overwhelms your network bandwidth, then it's probably insufficient. Uh, next one here is not segregating your network. You know, that sounds easy. Well, it depends on the size of your company. Yeah, you know, right? the, the, irony, the, the irony of this whole thing is that it, we spent all these years kind of saying, well, we've got all these different networks. And, you know, anytime you talk with somebody in the government, they're always, we've got all these networks and we're trying to figure out how to interconnect them. And then everybody interconnects them and they've got these, you know, flat networks. And, you know, you know we better segregate those for security. Wow. <laughs> so it becomes kind of, a, you know, which one should it be? Yeah, so anyway, uh, certainly segregating your networks. I, I tend to think of this a little bit differently. You know, we've been going more toward the notion of protecting applications more. So not necessarily segregating the network into random things, but saying, you know, if we have this application that's sensitive, put it in its own protective environment. So I don't know, is that segregating the network or is it basically segmenting applications or protecting applications? I don't know. I absolutely but, agree with you on that one, though. It's, you know, why does, you know, the janitor need access to payrolls, you know, database kind of mm -hmm. thing. You do need to protect the applications, and that's what I would call segregating the, or the network. Okay. Yeah, I think the terms are synonymous. It's a, in some respects, it just depends on your perspective of how you go about implementing things. But that notion of saying, you know, you shouldn't really just have a flat network, and it certainly shouldn't be divided up just because of some legacy, you know, merger or acquisition activity that you didn't, didn't complete. Hey, there should be some logic behind that, so. And certainly I you'd want to segregate we'll like your enterprise notion from your commercial facing notion. Yeah. Because your commercial part where customers are going to be hitting and whatnot is probably what's going to get DDoS. You yeah. want to make sure your enterprise is still be able to operationally correct mm -hmm. that action. Yeah, <laughs> in the good. process of getting DDoS as well. Yeah, so for example, if you have a, a customer-facing website or an internet-facing website, you probably want to segregate that from your infrastructure, you know, email yes. access, things like that. Yeah. Partly for the first one, that is, that should be part of your DDoS protection strategy because most likely the, the, uh, the outside-facing website is the most likely target of attack. Or right. if, it's, if it is, you know, infrastructure, you, you should at least you know which one You don't want all that is. coming yeah. in over one pipe. Because right. then you're going to get stuck. You know, you get stuck with everything's out at that yep. point. Yeah, absolutely. Next one, having a firewall but no encryption. This is this one I had to actually, you know, think about a little bit here. But the notion here is that, you know, we used to think of the firewall as separating the enterprise, the outside, from the inside. It's it's not enough anymore. And the, uh, you know, it you have to accept the fact that somebody that if they're trying to get to your data they're gonna penetrate your enterprise. They're gonna send phishing emails and get to access to somebody's internal machine or something like that. And so the argument here is that you really need to be protecting the data. I think it's, again, similar to what we were just talking about in terms of segregation, protecting your data at rest, using encryption to do that. Uh, that's the argument. I tend to agree. It's, uh, I think it's uh, you know, basically facilitating what we had described in and uh, number two. Well, I think it's an interesting perspective. These are the top five or six holes you've got in your strategy. Uh, they all they mention for in terms of network defense is firewalls. I mean, I thought we've moved, a, a, I would have said things like IDS or proxies or, <laughs> oh, good or any sort of, you know, WAFs. Yeah, or good WAFs. There's, yeah. I mean, there's a million other things you could be putting out there. And I think just saying having the firewall and no encryption is completely missing a whole segment of the things you should also be doing. That's uh, possibly true. You know, I guess in their defense, this is a sort of a article about this long, okay. and, I, and I think intended to be something you could get some quick sound bites to get thinking in your mind. We're going into a little more depth here. Your point is exactly right, but perhaps firewall is implying something more at the enterprise edge, and not just depending on the enterprise edge. Talking about you got to 
you got to do something about the soft gooey, gooey center too. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> yeah, how how many of the breaches in the in the last few years, you know, all the exposed credit card data was because all the stuff was sitting unencrypted in the database. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing I think you're driving at here is. Yeah, you're right, Jim. And you know, I guess to your, uh, <laughs> just to uh, elaborate on this just a little bit more, it is, you have to be careful with encryption too. And I think you had cited uh, Steve Belovin's blog. He had a blog on the topic, topic of encryption as well. Whereas, you know, if the encryption isn't pr implemented to protect against a particular threat, that is, if the operating system isn't locked down as well, I think was his primary point, you're not really going to do anything by encrypting the data. That is, there's some way to access the data, to decrypt that data. If the attackers have access to that method, they're still going to get to the data. So the encryption only protects you in the context that you actually put the uh, protection methods around that. So it's a subtlety that uh, actually needs to be thought about in the process of applying encryption. Uh, next item is here, corporate iPhones. Well, I wouldn't pick on iPhone. I think it's generally mobile devices have the tendency to poke holes in your enterprise. And I think the context here had to do with, um, you know, granting Wi-Fi access to the enterprise environment or, you know, sort of the BYOD thing. So I think, Matt, when we were talking earlier, using some MDM type solutions to be able to protect devices better, be able to track what's on them and be able to uh, establish some good policies about mobile devices on the enterprise and to be able to wipe out data if the devices are lost, things like that are probably sure. about if you, the right if, approach. If not, if not a full you know, mobile management suite, it may be mm -hmm. at least some sort of containerization where you can allow users to put their business on one half and their, whatever they're doing on their mm -hmm. own side. Exactly. Um, yep, very good. And the, uh, I think the comments in the, in the blog are, similarly, are very similar. Uh, next one is employees. You know, we've already talked about, here's Murray. He's our, right. he's our friend in helping to keep employees informed about their role in security, making everybody part of that. Couldn't agree more. You know, I added a sixth one here, and I think uh, I think it's an important one. You know, we've been talking about our, sort of our prediction of the development of destructive malware. It seems like the crypto locker, well, the you know, FBI had did some things with in conjunction with, I think, the, um, was it uh, the UK? Well, in any case, the, there so. were some activities to take down crypto locker and some other malware. I think that's put a little bit of a damper on some of the yeah. ransomware activities. Yeah. But uh, nevertheless, I think the destructive malware threat is still real. And in particular, I think it's more real in the sense that most organizations haven't really thought about, you know, making sure that you have good backups of the data necessarily. Or even if you do have good backups of the data, what would it be like to try to recover if hundreds of right. machines were uh, brought down or thousands having of machines. a handful that get ransomware and having to do recovery on that is one thing right that's probably manageable but trying to recover hundreds or thousands of machines that, yeah that's so, it's a much bigger problem or like what happened to my my son's business uh, workplace where they their file server got you know, it spread to their file server, and they didn't have good backups, mm -hmm. and they really didn't have IT people, let alone security people, and their recovery was a disaster. So even a simple case where it's a file server, it can be very complicated to restore, and if you haven't practiced it, it's, uh, it's more than likely the case that it's not going to work out when you really need it. So I, I think it's just about anything else, you know, <laughs> whether you're in, in athletics, you know, in sports or something. If you don't practice it, don't expect to do it right. <laughs> That's a good point. So uh, this is a case where I think practicing and, and having a plan for sort of the larger scale situation where you actually have some priorities set, you know, who are the folks that need to be restored first? Or is it the executives or is it the IT support people? Is you know, or something else that uh, it's important to really have a plan in place and to have an endorsement of that, so that people aren't clamoring and stepping on each other's toes. And then run the simulated way. fire drills on occasion. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so uh, with that, let's uh, go back to you, Matt, and uh, talk a little bit about Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. <laughs> so this one is this is pretty cool. Um, I always like reading about things that. The normal users with a little bit of code and a little like a small purchase at home mm -hmm. can actually go out and test. The researcher Matthew Van Hoof put out um, a paper and also did a demonstration at BruCon, which is a security conference in Belgium. 
and Brussels. And basically what you can do is you can take very cheap, relatively cheap Wi-Fi commodity hardware, mm -hmm. little USB ones you plug into the side of your laptop, a little bit of code he wrote, and turn your laptop into a Wi-Fi jammer. Mm. So this also, this, this paper that he put together and the, the presentations and everything around it, you go into a little bit of like, you know, transmission theory and things like uh, exponential back off in particular, which mm -hmm. is something I learned back in school in the, in the context of Ethernet, but it applies here as well. When you've got two people trying to talk at the same time, you know, if you, if, you're, if you pick up the phone and start talking and there's like a little bit of lag or, you know, you start talking over each other, people usually sort of stop and wait and figure out when they can come in and That step never in. happens on the program here. That never happens on the program. <laughs> it never happens on conference calls. <laughs> Absolutely not. 100% <laughs> solved. Um, but the whole idea is that people sort of know that that's the way they're supposed to behave. There's a protocol behind it. And right. literally there's a protocol here as well in Wi-Fi. And if you decide that you're not going to and you're just going to keep talking and talking, Everyone else will keep checking back in and saying, oh, wait, he's, he's not done. Let me just be, I'll wait. Mm -hmm. And you can basically jam the entire channel that way. Uh, he actually goes into some interesting things about, um, I want to call it uh, a capture effect. Mm -hmm. Is apparently if you're listening for a signal, if you've got two competing signals, the one that's the higher strength and lower bit rate will be the one that gets decoded. So mm. if you want to jam effectively, you boost your power and you transmit at a slower bit rate, and whoever's trying to select between the signals will say, oh, that one's a lot easier. I'll listen to that guy. You're curious. Now, yeah. I would have expected the higher signal, but the lower bit rate? I think the lower bit rate is because it's easier to decode, and, and it's, it's more likely that it's not random noise. Mm. I believe that's the, the case. I, I'm okay. not very sure. I'm not the, the biggest expert on, on radio and transmission theory, but I, the, the work is all there if you want to go and mm -hmm. read it and grab the code. I mean, it's up on GitHub. Uh, okay. So there's a couple of the mechanisms he describes in the paper as well. Um, they basically have to do with not behaving by the proper rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, if you want to jam selectively, he, they devised a way of reading directly from memory so that you know it, it, there's a very small window. So if someone starts transmitting, you have to listen, figure out that someone's transmitting, figure out it's the person that you want to block that's transmitting, and then construct your, your jamming and, you know, and transmit it before he's done talking. Mm -hmm. And there's a, an interesting mechanism for doing that, reading directly from memory instead of reading from somewhere. It, it was pretty cool. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm excited about this. I want to go home and try this myself because the code's out there. And I feel like if anybody had, you know, if you're sort of just starting out and you want to play with this sort of thing, it's, it's right there. It's available mm -hmm. to you. Make sure you're in a Faraday cage. When you I, yeah, yes, so you use your local Faraday cage. Climb in your microwave oven or something. Right? Um, to be a jerk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like I, what, what, what else can you do with this other than make everybody else's day miserable? In a practical, in a real life, ex, ex, in probably not too many things. Yeah. If you had your own wireless IDS and response system, if you want to include some of this within it, Say if you had somebody who was trying to do DOP attacks all the time, and you're able to isolate and say, this MAC address is, is a pain in my butt. I'd like to make sure that no one else is able to hear him. You might be able to use that as a response. Uh, again, you are really attacking somebody who's transmitting, and there may be legal, mm -hmm. there may be laws against that in your area. I am not a lawyer mm -hmm. sort of thing, but. Well, you know, I think perhaps another perspective here is useful. That is, understanding what attacks might be able to occur against Wi-Fi will help you to make understanding, you know, think about the uh, CIA, you know, consider it not the agency, but oh, the, the principles of security that is <laughs> the culinary, you the, uh, you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. If you're developing a system and considering availability to be impor an important thing and are considering the simplicity of Wi-Fi, you want to consider whether that really is a path you want to take. That is, it, understanding the attacks could be launched again it, against it help you make better judgment about what are the right choices to make in developing a system. That's, that's mm -hmm. the way I tend to look at this. Well, this, this was previously, until this sort of research came out, it's previously the domain of people with like expensive mm -hmm. software to find radios that had both transmit and receive capabilities. I think that's really where the, the cool factor comes in, whereas you just have to go out and buy a little USB dongle and you've got this capability as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, and the, the barrier to entry is one of those things that you consider as a part of threat. You were talking about earlier, you know, breaking Diffie-Hellman 1024, mm -hmm. it's that barrier to entry that you start to you consider as a part of the threat. Are you motivated? Do you have the resources available to do it? That's how you define a threat. Right. So, right? Interesting. All right, very good. So let's take a look at the internet weather for the last week or so here. And uh, first item is scan probes on port 5555 TCP. Um, this is actually associated with 
a few different potential applications, and there were even some, you know, worms and backdoor type things that are associated with it. But uh, I think the most likely choice, or perhaps a, a likely choice at least, is HP Data Protector. This is a data backup tool. So if you're trying to protect against destructive malware, this might be a tool you'd be using. And uh, it has a, a port available on port 5555, which actually, actually is uh, it's a telnet interface, if I understand, understand correctly. And there was a buffer overflow vulnerability associated with this not too, too long ago. It's actually a, a couple of years old, but nevertheless, that uh, is potentially something that uh, folks are looking for here. That is, if you can get access to data, that, that might be something an attacker might be trying to do. Uh, but there are some other potential applications. I was trying to think of um, uh, one of them. Oh, one of them uh, was uh, potentially, I think, uh, uh, SQL Express, uh, which is, I think, a sort of a variation or a tool associated with Microsoft SQL Database. Uh, I can't really um, uh, confirm that. But nevertheless, there is some scanning on this. Most of the probes are from the U.S. It's actually a specific, relatively small provider in the U.S. that uh, is the source of most of this probing activity. So keep in mind that, um, you know, somebody might be trying to get into those, uh, into an application that's using that port. Looking at the top 10 most probed ports, port 23 is still at the top of the list. No change really there. We did have some uh, sort of the uh, an increase in the ranking actually uh, associated with a relatively significant increase in activity on port 1900 UDP. We're going to take a little closer look at that as well as uh, port 23 here in a moment. Followed by 1433, you know, if you look at our report from last week, 1433 is relatively consistent with what it was uh, doing last week. Uh, and uh, I guess it was uh, probably about two or three months ago we saw sort of an increase in activity and it's been sort of holding steady at that level. That's uh, targeting Microsoft SQL database. Followed by port 22 TCP, 445 TCP, 53 UDP. Now that's jumped up a little bit. I suspect that's associated with reflective denial of service attack activity, which by the way is associated with the 1900. We're gonna, again, we're gonna take a look at that a little bit later. 80 TCP, 3389 remote desktop protocol, and then uh, last but not least here, 137 UDP. Is someone really looking for old Windows? Yeah, well, <laughs> we that know that we, some people have been doing that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, there's some old versions of Windows 2000 hanging around. Still hanging out there. So yeah. if you have 15-year-old operating systems out there, you probably should take it offline pretty soon. So. Anyway, uh, let's take a look at the uh, scan probes on port 23 TCP. That's Telnet, of course. We were looking at the last 90 days of activity, and um, you know there are tens of thousands of sources geographically distributed associated with this, but the most significant volume, in fact, this is actually showing up in our volumetric alerts right now, not just our scan probing alerts, but the most significant volume is coming from China. And I drew a line across here, the red line, that's just uh, a line that I put on as a reference, just to show that, you know, over that last 90 days, there definitely is sort of an upward trend in the number of probes that we're seeing. And it's quite a lot of probes. When you have 350 million probes in an hour, that basically you could probe the entire internet in uh, probably about four or five hours uh, if they're doing that uh, effectively. Next one is scan probes on port 1900 UDP, that simple service discovery protocol most frequently used in reflective denial of service attacks. We're looking at the last 90 days of activity. Now, there are some controls on the network here that, are, that uh, a number of ISPs have been putting in place to be able to get this under control. You know, SSDP is not really an internet protocol. It's really supposed to be a LAN protocol. And the consequence of uh, devices that are offering this to the internet are just that it gets used for den reflective denial of service attacks. So in any case here, most of this activity, we're seeing actually about a thousand addresses in Russia that are the source of this activity, or at least appear to be the source. This may actually be the request side of a reflective attack against those, uh, those addresses. You know, there's a little bit of uh, turbulence going on in that part of the, of the world right now. So there's a possibility that this is uh, uh, related to that. So I'm going to go with the notion that these are spoof sources conducting an attack against a number of addresses uh, targeting uh, uh, Russia, and we've seen a, uh, an increase in those. But I think for the most part, those should get blocked. Uh, next item here, the most sources doing the probing, right around 50% of it is port 23 TCP. We're going to look at the graph associated with that. It remains at the top of the ranking. Perhaps the most notable additional one is port 19 UDP, again, associated with uh, reflective denial service attack activity. So we're seeing a lot of uh, sort of jumping in activity here. 
again, perhaps a surge in um, denial of service activity in general, we'll take a little bit of a closer look at that one as well. Incidentally, uh, 445 TCP holding steady in its spot, 22 TCP holding steady in its spot, and uh, most of these others are associated with peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer activity. Scan sources on port 23 TCP, that's Telnet. Uh, we're looking at the last 90 days of activity and uh, there weren't any really obvious spikes or anything going on here in the last week or so, but again, putting that trend line on there, there definitely is an upward trend in the number of sources and we're up around 90,000 sources in a given hour. Now that's just, you know, if we were to look at this across the day, I think we'd be up in the probably 200 or 300,000 sources yeah. that are identified um, just in the, in the sort of the visibility of this platform and the analysis platform we're using here. And then looking at scan sources on port 19 UDP, this is a character generator or some people call it charging. Uh, I call it care gen, but nevertheless, it's, uh, we're looking at the last 30 days of activity. And just in the last you know, week or so here, we see some spikes in activity. Sources are pri primarily, or at least the addresses in the sources are primarily Brazil and Russia. Again, this may be even uh, related to that port 1900 activity that we were just talking about in some respects, perhaps some attack activity targeting toward Brazil as well. Again, this is most likely associated with reflective denial service attack activity that is uh, showing up. Again, um, some controls are being in, put in place for that as well. So that's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at attthreattrack at list.att.com. And you can find AT&T Threat Track on the ATT Tech Channel on YouTube and iTunes. And don't forget, you can also uh, go to the, uh, the AT&T Security Conference and pick up some of the uh, uh, presentations from that conference as well if you're looking for things to watch. You can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at ATT Security. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, I'd like to thank you, John Hogeboom, Matt Kaiser. Thank you, Jim Clausing. I'm Brian Rexrode. We'll be back next week with a new episode. And until then, keep your network safe.